Well, it was late in 1980s that I began this journey. Um, certainly feel that it was an interesting time and a lot that was set in that time frame kind of brings me to this story and how and where we are today. Um, at that time in my life, I was pretending to get through high school in some form. I was working as a confectionery in a mall candy store and working through the night to make candy and do different things to um, generate additional money. On weekends, I was working as a photographer for weddings and bar mitzvahs and all of those fun occasions. And during the week, when I wasn't pretending to be at school where I was supposed to be, I was editing those videos and um, doing all I can to make some money. So it's interesting times. I found myself in a lot of great situations that kind of impacted how and what I do and make decisions on a regular basis that um, make differences in our lives. Uh, what I can say unequivocally in this room, I can say confidently that there is no two people that have had the same experiences. So the things that we all think are common knowledge or common sense are not so common to everybody beside us when you get into a detailed question. So um, I'm gonna share some stories and some history that hopefully is compelling and understands how and where my experience come from that I think um, frames some of the experiences and the benefits that we've had. So I'm gonna dive right in. Let me get here. So early on in my career I was doing, as I said, photography and video. I was a uh, confectionery, pretending to get through high school, and during Christmas season I was actually working in the malls. If you remember when there was kiosks and it had a polystyrene plane with a one penny nail in the front and you'd throw it up and it'd come right back to you. And I was that kid throwing the plane all the time and selling those um, planes. And I found still the need, I was still hungry and needed to make a bigger impact and I came across the vending business in some form. I um, started with machines that looked just like this. Ironically don't have pictures of them, or I'm sure I do somewhere, but um, this vending machine is as close to what I had as possible. This has the luxury of a bill acceptor that I didn't have and also has a gum and mint tray that I couldn't afford in the vending machine I bought. So kind of funny to look back at where I started and how and what was made. The first soda machine I bought actually was this exact machine with five selections and took cans and was in a small office. Um, so um, that machine actually survived Hurricane Andrew down in South Miami and the entire building was blew out but the break room was whole so my machine survived which is kind of funny as, as you do that. So early on in vending, um, I found myself completely intrigued by the thought that when I was previously going to sleep, I wasn't generating anything and I was very, very hungry and I found myself wanting to either sleep less or find something to do to fill the time if I woke up earlier or I went to sleep later. And I found myself when I went to, when I went to bed, once I had a vending machine, in fact, I had three out at the time, um, I found myself laying down believing that when I woke up, the cash boxes were gonna have more money in them, which was pretty interesting. It was a very different train of thought. Certainly didn't have data to show what sold at night, but I had that opportunity and it made me feel very different than when I felt like sleep was a waste of time. So um, moving forward, uh, in the early 90s, uh, I found myself, if you'd asked me, completely entrenched in vending and believing that that was my path and I was gonna make a lot of money because I could make money when I was not doing it and the machines were gonna generate and the things that needed to be repaired I could do and I could get accounts and all of those things that mattered. Um, five years in, my parents had been saving up for a trip to Europe. So my second flight that I'd ever take was to Europe with my family and we were, um, if you remember early 90s, um, that trip was handled by a travel agent that helped book our flights and gave us some coordination, but not a lot of details in advance. We were certainly doing it on the budget. And we found that we were traveling the countryside with AAA maps, if you remember the books that you would flip from page to page and they would route you. So we found ourselves in the Swiss Alps in the middle of the night, it's probably two in the morning, and we're all dead tired and finally pulled up to a city as we were clearly lost and found that there was nowhere to stay. We came across a motel that, this is not representative of it, but an old motel that looked like that. And there was nobody there. And we found that there was a small kiosk mounted to the side of the building that you actually paid for your room and it printed out a receipt that gave you a code for your room. So this is early 90s and I remember that being so impactful believing that I had just interacted with the world's largest vending machine. And I thought it was completely intriguing that you could convert something like a hotel into a vending machine. It was unattended. They captured dollars while they were sleeping and they were renting out rooms that otherwise were unobtainable at that point. So they'd accomplished some very interesting things. Fast forward, 
um, it really seems that we're, it's becoming a self-service world, right? We're clearly here gathering, talking about it, but the impact that we've seen since that, um, since that interaction in that hotel is very interesting in how much that has grown. And I don't know that we realize it until we sit back and start to touch on all the things that we're handling ourselves. As an example, I said we had used a travel agent to get the flights and some of those other components for that trip. Today, we don't do any of that. There is no question that most everybody, if not everybody in this room sitting here today could pull out their phone, research a trip, book a flight from here to Europe, could order an Uber, leave this conference, wake up in Europe, rent a hotel, rent a car, travel the countryside while waiting for a cruise ship to come in port, board the cruise ship, and have yet to interact with a person. So if that's not self-service, I'm not really sure where we've gotten to, but that change in how and what we can do for ourselves and how those decisions can make impact a lot of things like the cost of those things, but more importantly, the availability to us, right? So back in those days, the ability to um, put together a trip or an itinerary to Europe seemed unobtainable financially and even just from a data perspective. You didn't know where you were going. You had a friend that went and they told you a city you had to go to. They told you about a hotel that was so cute and they served a great breakfast and all of those details. Well, today we can do that sitting here on our phone. So hopefully you make it through this before you book your flights, but somebody's gonna end up in Europe, I think, after this. So moving forward, we look at, as an example here, is the world's largest Marriott. It's in Orlando. It's Orlando, uh, it's Marriott World Center. Um, so if you compare that to what was this motel, they have managed to turn the world's largest Marriott into a complete vending machine. So I, I'm a Marriott fan. Um, we stay in a lot of Marriott's for work and a lot of our team members do. And actually the reason I'm a Marriott fan and not a Hilton fan is the Marriott app is better. And that's really how it came about. Both of them offered me similar rewards. Both of them have plenty of room capacity. Both of them are compelling um, in properties that are available and all of those details. But the Marriott interface is significantly better. And so somehow or another, Marriott gets two to 300 rooms of stay from us every year because the app is better. So that interface for self-service. But I could book this hotel, and if I'm the one going in my Marriott app, I can check in on my app. My phone is now my key. I can spend the entire stay there and leave and depart, including all of my on-premises spend and all of the other things that I wanna do within the property and leave and never have interacted with a person if I chose not to. So that piece of it takes really what I saw early on in Europe to a whole different level. And I don't know that any of us really take that for what it is and kind of how and what that has accomplished in what it is. If you take it to the next step, um, Royal Caribbean, I'm a huge fan. Just finished uh, checking in for our cruise last night before this conference, checked in for a cruise that we're going on over New Year's with my family. And four days ago, Royal Caribbean took ownership of the icon of the seas. Um, largest cruise ship on the water today, about 7,000 passengers, 3,800 crews, so 10,000 people on board. Um, we've booked our cruise, not on this ship, but we've booked our cruise, checked in for our cruise, have our luggage tags, we'll drive to the port, hand our bags to somebody, and board the ship and not have interacted with somebody. Again, I think really compares to the largest vending machine out there, certainly the largest on the water. Those experiences are pretty remarkable. There's an app based now, and that interface makes it compelling enough that you really do want to um, just interact with the app. There's a, there's a whole new generation coming behind us that has a real hesitation of engaging with other people and apps and texting and all of those different platforms give them that ability to get, get the connections that they want without ever having to interact with people. So the better the interface is, the more likely you use it. The newest ships like the Icon or um, the Odyssey that we're going on, the app that runs that literally does the entire boat. So They've got a Starbucks on board and you can order the Starbucks remotely even on board because you're on their network. You can look at your photos because they do facial recognition with AI and you can buy your photos from your phone and they come over digitally. So you could literally shop your photos sitting in your room on your phone, order your photos, pay for them and leave with your photos and never have gone to the gift shop and interacted with that chaos if we've all, we've all done that and remembered. So the impact that I think these types of platforms have is it shows that we can take most anything that we're selling today as a service or a product and we can turn it into self-service. And the key there is, is what's compelling that drives our end users, our guests. And so if you take the example of Marriott or Hilton, and 
I'm not here to bash Hilton, but it's probably been four years since I've logged into the app, so perhaps it's better today. But the user interface was what kept me with one or the other. So as we build platforms and as we take technology and apply it, how and what we apply it to is incredibly important to the success or the failure of that product. <clears throat> so one of the experiences that I've had the opportunity to, to have, so um, Game Time is a large format arcade. Um, so we're in the entertainment space. One of our associations is called IAPA. It's the International Amusement Trade Park Association. And um, so clearly Disney is a member there. And I've had the opportunity to do some Disney Institute courses. And um, this sign, if anybody hasn't seen it before, is over the entrance of the Magic Kingdom in Orlando. And it clearly says, here, here you leave today, enter the world of yesterday, tomorrow, and fantasy. And so in some of those interactions with Disney cast members or Disney's trainers, I took the opportunity to say, why is that sign there and where did it come from? Again, one of those things that I think framed a lot of the decisions that I make and leaves us in a position where I make decisions based on guest experiences rather than end result. And that guest experience drives to the end result. So the story as I heard it, and certainly I like to repeat it in the form that I interpreted it, but. Um, Walt Disney was walking his park in Anaheim many years before, before he started building Orlando. And there was a family that was rushing to the door. They were rushing to get out. And so he started walking, following them to hear what they had to say. And the husband says to the wife, or man says to the woman, um, we need to get going because the traffic is starting to build up. And so he's intrigued and he's following them closer. And he realized that while they were riding the sky bucket, they could see the highway. And so that ability to not control his entire environment made a significant difference on that guest experience and had them wanting to leave the park rather than stay and enjoy the park. So um, looking at that and framing it, you say, okay, well, he's now taken it and said, I wanna control the entire environment. Really, I wanna control the entire guest experience. And that guest experience allows him to do many different things. I think if we look at it in the sense of a self-service environment, understanding that our guests experience when they walk up and they interface with whatever platform, technology, touchscreen, um, uh, other, other options that are there, um, will find that they very quickly have a different impact on how that goes, so the Marriott app versus the Hilton app. So in the environment of, of Orlando, again, huge fan, obviously done a few of their courses and not a Disney fan in the sense that I won't go stand in the heat, but a Disney fan in the sense of love their successes and to learn from them. So in the Orlando park, as you may know, there's a tunnel system that was built underneath the entire Magic Kingdom. For those of you that know, it's very interesting. For those of you who don't, you'd say we're in Florida, it's a swamp, you can't build underground. Magic Kingdom is 13 feet above sea level, or above swamp level, if you will, in that market. And when you're walking up to the main entrance where this sign is, you're actually walking up a sloped walkway that you don't notice. And that gave him the ability to move cast members between areas without people seeing them, gave him the ability to move garbage out of the park without people carrying buckets or large carts of garbage. So again, controlling that environment. I like to look at that and say, well, that's really our software, if I'm gonna apply it, and that's our API, right? So you're taking a platform and you need it to talk to something else. Well, how smooth can you do that? How quickly can you get the garbage out of the way? Where do you have errors? Where do you have things that the guest experience isn't what it should? Does the program go to non-responding and then crash um, because they're carrying garbage through the park in that example? Um, he controls it in a different manner and that he built it as these um, three different worlds that uh, gave them the ability to really control that flow of the park. And so a park could be very full and not necessarily feel full, so he added capacity. If his end result was to monetize the park, which I think we would all agree when we get into business and we go to work, we're trying to figure out how to make money for it, um, I think that that's a very different goal than he had framed out. And again, in the things that I've heard and kind of how I've interpreted it, I think he believed that if the guest experience was compelling, people would leave their money behind. And I think he's right. I think if the guest experience is compelling, I'm going back to Marriott on a regular basis. And so if you come into Disney World and you're going down Main Street, there's breadcrumbs the entire way that are there to monetize. And amazingly, if you watch the traffic flow, as people come in in the morning or at any point in the day, they walk through Main Street, they're intrigued by what they see, and they keep walking. But on the way out, those stores are completely slammed. 
and they've had an experience and they want to leave with something memorable. Well, do we think that through in an experience of self-service where we walk them through a sales opportunity and on their way out at checkout, are we upselling them? Are we showing them something compelling? Are we driving them for additional spend? Are we doing those things that impact them, not because we're just simply trying to make a dollar, but because it's compelling and it makes an impact to the guest's experience? So I believe we can apply some of those, and that's one of the experiences that I took that I think applies to every interaction that our guests have that should be thought through. This is an interesting piece that I found many years ago. There's um, late 1800s, um, uh, Alwell Stroger was his name, um, found himself in a very strange place. Um, here he is in the late 1800s, and he's an undertaker. He buries people. He, he, that's his business. That's his business model. Um, earlier on, it just seemed like it was a, just another piece of what happened. So the story as I've heard it, which is interesting and I like to go with it, is that he had a family member, a friend of the family um, that had passed, and he was very surprised to find that he didn't get the business. And so he tried to figure out what had happened and understand what took place. And after digging around, he found that a competitor's wife worked at the phone switchboard. So not that any of us remember, but in the early 1800s, as phones were just getting going, there was female operators and you would call and there would be a large switchboard and they'd literally take a quarter inch connector and they'd plug it into a line that connected you to the other end. So Allwell found the need for the outcome that he was desiring, really what was the outcome that he was trying to get, which was to reroute around the phone system that currently existed, which were people making decisions. So he had really three choices. He could, one, go to the phone company and show what took place and get her fired. The other option is he clearly could take legal action and um, may or may not find any success there and may or may not gain the business back. Or the third option was impact how phones worked. And so he came up with what you, what you see in this picture here, which was the Stro Stroger switch. Um, and that was the first mechanized switch that worked on all phone systems because it simply took pulses. If we all remember rotary phones, the reason they go back at a certain speed is because they tick each time. And each time they tick, that relay would move one over and it would set the stage for which connection you went to. So he had made the first system that was really universally available on most every system and very quickly, um, Bell, Mom Bell bought the system and started building COs with hundreds and hundreds of these switches in them and replaced female operators. So his desire to have a net outcome, which was again to be monetized, wasn't really I want to figure out how to make money with a phone system, was I want my fair shot at business and if somebody's trying to connect with me, they should be able to connect directly with me. So. Um, not really sure that anybody would look at someone that is completely disconnected from an industry, even today, that would wake up and be a disruptor, right? There was somebody that was working somewhere at some point and came up and here we have Uber and at some point we have Google and all of those things that are true disruptors. Well, those come by the necessity of an outcome that they're desiring, not necessarily just the monetization. So the story is interesting to me and just that he was so compelled to make an impact on the outcome that he wanted, which was to be able to get direct in contact with his customers, that he eventually, or essentially, modified our entire phone systems and still that we operate today in obviously a self-service phone world. So, very interesting. The next piece is interesting because it really goes back to phones and we just talked about phones 135 years ago, or 140 years ago, in the impact that he had. But the single most impactful device that we've had in the last 50 years is probably the iPhone or a smartphone in some device in that it's completely self-service. I said it earlier, from this room you could book that trip all the way to Europe or anywhere else for that matter. You could buy something that may be delivered to your house before you get back home or you could get delivered to the hotel if you want from Amazon or you could order food to your room and all of those other things. What's amazing about this device when you think it through and the things that we should take from these devices on a regular basis in how our guests interact with our opportunities is that this doesn't really come with a manual and yet it's the most complicated device any of us have seen. It simply has an intuitive interface 
that says, if I want to accomplish something, what would make sense to me? If I want to move this icon, how do I do that? Well, I hold it, and now it starts to shake. It, you know, that early wobble of an app that seemed so exciting that we could move said that we could now move it somewhere. There's lots of other things in our computers and our smartphones that are so intuitive that we don't necessarily see them. We look at our Windows or Mac, if you're on a Mac device today, when you're working at your desktop, and we think that we've learned how to use those computers, and we have to some degree. But there's still a reason that a folder looks like a paper folder, and it's because it makes sense to us. That's where something goes, and that's where we find it. Right, so it's a file cabinet. You can put it in a folder, you can put it in a file, and you can go all the way down into the drawer you want and pull that file out, and in that file, out comes your documents. So from an intuitive perspective, understanding that if our guests can figure it out without reading, we've accomplished a major goal in what our end result is gonna be. If you take that experience and you make them read through the steps of how to do it, which early on in that, in that trip in the early 90s in Europe, there was a sign above head on how to use this little kiosk to get into the, um, into the motel. The problem was, was we didn't read Swedish. So we stood there staring at it and tried to figure it out. And yet it was still intuitive enough that we did figure it out. Um, but today's interactions, you can take something and really make that workflow to where it just makes sense for the end user. And if they don't find any friction through it and they enjoy the experience better, it's more compelling. If it's more compelling, the things that you're trying to do to impact what they're doing in that experience is gonna be better uh, absorbed. So in, uh, oh God, I'm gonna say, 2006, I think it was December 26, 2006. I know it was the day after Christmas. I'd have to look up the date. I remember that date so specifically because I was on an aircraft going from Fort Lauderdale to Las Vegas on a nonstop flight. It was one of the first flights I had that had live TV and it was a, a red eye and I thought for sure I was gonna get on the plane and sleep and I remember turning on the news and thinking I was watching a movie. But the tsunamis had hit overseas in Asia and I saw live time what was happening where now we know 280,000 people lost their lives at, in that tsunami. So I remember that impact so, so significantly and what came from that trip was interesting. It was the day after Christmas. It was the only appointment I could get with leadership at IGT, um, slot machine company. And we had an idea for a product that we wanted to roll out in casinos and um, we were going there to pitch it. A friend of ours had got us the meeting and he was meeting me at the airport. I showed up very tired because I believed I could fill my vending route the night before and drive to the airport and sleep on the plane and I never slept. But I got to IGT and was expecting a very different outcome than what I had pulled up to. I pulled up to what looked like a flex space office, so a small warehouse um, with a small office in the front and um, you know, not small, but certainly not what I was expecting. I was expecting this massive manufacturing plant and they're pushing out slot machines on a regular basis and trucks rolling in with parts and machines that look amazing. And I was gonna be a kid in a candy store. I was all excited to see what they're building and how they build it. And I pull up and it's this little boring office. And so we talk about the product and it was very interesting. And, and then I um, said to the gentleman I was meeting with, I was like, well, you know, is there anything exciting here to see? Like, what are you guys building? And he says, well, we don't do anything here. This is just, you know, we have a small R&D office and we have um, our administrative offices and our sales team and that's who's here. And I said, well, what's in your R&D office? And he says, well, I'm not really supposed to show you, but we're close to um, developing it. So, you know, keep it in confidence. And I thought, okay, I don't know what he's gonna show me, but kind of interesting. So early on, this was a slot machine and it had a cushion in the front. And this is you know, more of a cocktail table, if you will, where it's got the bucket here, not the bucket that hangs out the bottom. Um, and then this was what they were working on. And so he says to me, we go into the room and it's got a single slot machine sitting there. And I said, you know, okay, so what are you showing me? And the slot machine didn't have a screen to it and it didn't have any software, didn't have anything going. And I'm th thinking, okay, he's gonna tell me something that's interesting, so trying to get to that. And he goes, well, what do you think? And I'm trying to understand what he's saying. Well, step back, and he says to me, he says, but look at that control panel on this slot machine. I said, yeah, it looks great, like any other slot machine I've seen. I can put my hands on it and touch the buttons. He says, we're three and a half years into that and $250 million. And I remember stopping, pausing, 
and having to re-ask the question three or four times. There was no way he didn't say two and a half million. It wasn't 25 million, but $250 million, a quarter billion dollars. And what he had to show for it was a rubber mat that had a cup holder, a place for buttons, a small curve to it. And then he got into the details and he started telling me how that people that spend more time at slot machines spend more money. It's a numbers game, right? So they, they pay out a certain percentage based on the laws of average. And the way they make money is not by somebody walking up and putting a $100 bill in and it all going away. It's by somebody putting a $100 bill in and spending 20, 30, 50 minutes. But over time, that law of average allows them to win. That's their edge. And if they can make it more comfortable, they can gain seconds or minutes at their machine over a Bally's machine or another competitor at the time was um, the one that they were looking for was Konami. Konami had come out with a machine that was really starting to take over the game floor so that um, that business is actually made up of revenue share. Most of the casinos don't own their equipment. They make the bulk of the revenue. It's an 80-20 or a 70-30 split with the factories. And so knowing that if they could impact 30 seconds or a minute at a machine, it could mean three or five dollars more per machine, per drop, per hour, per week, whatever that number was, and they have 500,000 machines out, you would impact it in any form you can. So he starts to say that they had engineers start figuring out how wide the control panel should be before it curves in, so where your elbow, where your arms rest. And then it's how much deformation should that cushion take, so should it go in a quarter inch or three quarters of an inch with the average weight of someone's hand? And the, if that material allows you to sweat, is it comfortable or not comfortable? Can that material be clean? Will it feel clean when you walk up to the machine? Will that control panel be convertible? So today's slot machines are still, still a very similar design, but where the buttons are now have a touch screen. So they had invested all of this money into what they called the perfect um, control panel, otherwise, you know, a quarter billion dollars. And so I took from that that you could truly design something to be perfect in what your definition of perfect is. So in my example, when, I, when we've worked on our kiosk interface and we've made impacts and I get to a screen that I like and a button placement that I like and the design of the button the way that I want it and all of those elements, um, I want to roll it out. And I want to roll it out faster than what I would call perfect because the reality is, is what I call perfect today is not perfect tomorrow. It's a moving target. We're certainly moving at a faster and faster pace. And so I've come to realize that the cost of perfection is simply progress. So in our world, we take those elements that we want to impact and we say we don't need them to be perfect because we want to progress at a different pace and we want to learn at a different pace. If we don't put it in the market while we have our, our own view on it in our lab, in our office, and we look at the kiosk and we understand the interface and we want to move something and we want to do something, it has nothing to do with what the guest is going to decide. The guest is going to walk up and make a very quick decision. Do they trust the device? Are they willing to put money in it or a credit card? Are they comfortable with what they're about to do or not do without a team member's interaction? Are they going to get the end result that they want? So all of those elements are going to be left up to our customers. They're not going to be left up to us in the design, the design stage. So we've taken the approach that the cost of perfection is progress and we'd rather take the progress. So we oftentimes deploy something um, that has either bugs to it or not necessarily the workflow that we want, but understand that we're going to very quickly monitor it and see what impacts we can make and how we would adjust that because we want to get feedback. So um, again, what I took from IGT was that you could really get something to be perfect to what, you, um, what you'd like it to be, but not necessarily at a cost that we can take or at a timeline we could take. I think everybody in this room can raise their hand if they've tried to build their own website or have a website built for their company. And I think it's very clear that that can become a um, roadblock where you, you want it so perfect that you continue to put off on hold and sending the web development team exactly what you want versus deploying a website, seeing it live time and saying, I'd like this background to be different. I think the text should be bigger. Place another image here. So that ability to roll something out is a significant savings in getting progress than it is looking for perfection. So looking at the things that we look at today and we say, um, why is self-service technology really in use? And I think we can all look at it and come up with different ideas. Um, but going back to the Schroeder example, 
uh, having a goal and an outcome, or even a Walt Disney's example of having a goal or an outcome from a guest service perspective, starts to really change how and what that workflow looks like. So customer convenience, I think we can all say customer convenience from a self-service perspective is absolutely something we think we're impacting. Um, but we can dig a little bit better and we can say, is customer convenience really the issue or did we expand the market to where there wasn't a market? So in the example in my little soda machine that was in um, an architecture firm that went through Hurricane Andrew, which I, again, I think it's such a funny story to find the one room that survived that had my vending machine in it and papers down the road as, as you go um, from that building. The, that ability to sell sodas in that small office environment was non-existent. I couldn't place an employee there and justify it. You couldn't put sodas there on a, on a honor system. In today's technology, we can do a lot better with it as we have self-service um, break room solutions, as, as you all know, but um, you, you couldn't do that. So what we did was we expanded the market by having a self-service opportunity, and that's what vending really did, and that was the opportunity that I saw. So customer convenience is really much more broad in that we take on opportunities that could have never existed, right? So maybe in a small market, you wouldn't be able to build and man a um, car wash today, yet you can build and man a car. You can build a car wash and send a technician out once a, once a week or even on an on-demand basis when it's needed because you've got the data delivery to you and they can pull up, swipe their car, drive through the car wash. You've made money. It's literally a massive vending machine. Um, the operational efficiencies that come with the technology. Um, I'll touch on just, you know, from, again, experiences are interesting, but I think the definition of words on a regular basis are, are more interesting than, than other people give credit to. Um, and so the definition of technology, and, and you can certainly look it up, but the definition that I think applies most is really the ability to accomplish the same goal for the same effort on multiple occasions. So if walking up to a kiosk and putting a bill into it and selecting a product, then a product comes out, that ability to do that is really just technology applied. So I think technology by every word when we're talking about, by every definition when we're talking about it, is the ability to replicate an end result for the same effort. So you go to your iPhone and you click on an app and it opens. Or you um, get in your car and you want to start it and it starts. So that technology is what we've all become accustomed to, but that's that operational efficiency of, um, you know, while you could say a kiosk doesn't get sick or call out, it does, they break. Right? So there's, there's hardware that fails, but from a reliability perspective, we certainly find it to be much more reliable than a um, team member in some cases or multiple team members that you count on. So the operational efficiencies of having it there and it being ready all the time is one of the reasons I think self-service starts to really get implemented more. Enhanced guest experience. Um, if you have a line when you walked into our center, um, we used to have card host stands, so you we, we sell game cards, and you walk up. Once you have your game card, you go, and again, it's that next evolution in self-service. You tap your card on any machine, and it starts. And the next evolution from that was actually now that you tap your card, and it starts. Well, when the game is over and it's counting tickets, the tickets go right onto your card. There's no paper tickets, and all of those things that happen. But that guest experience is allowed to be what they want it to be. So if they walk up to a team member early on and our card host was there, if they were four or five people down in line and we had really worked hard to get our team members to work with a guest to make sure they're buying the right product and they understand what they're getting, on a Friday or Saturday night, they come to the front of the line and they get to the card host and the card host says, oh, have you been here before? And they just want you, they want to cut you off. Like, I just want a $50 card. And they don't want to hear anything. And then they come back and they say, oh, that's not what I wanted. I didn't realize I could buy this product and it would be a better value for me. So them wanting their own experience and not necessarily wanting to be impacted by their sales pitch, if you, if you will, they saw it that way rather than it being an informative opportunity, um, that guest experience is better. They can walk up to a kiosk and they can blast through the screens if they've been there before and they're comfortable with what they're getting or they can go at their own pace and they can understand what's there. We still, um, from time to time, or certainly on busier days, we do kiosk ambassadors. And so those are people that are there to help work that flow because we don't offer a card host stand anymore. We certainly offer, if someone needs assistance, we'll assist them. And if somebody needs assistance and doesn't want to work at a kiosk, they can go to any, they can go to our bar, they can go to a server, they can buy the product anywhere else. Um, but our kiosk ambassadors are there because the technology isn't as intuitive as we want it. So if anybody um, you know, travels with Delta, and you were traveling with Delta 15 years ago, maybe a little bit more, 
early on they were starting to put kiosks out. They were one of the first airlines that we saw do them, certainly here in Fort Lauderdale in Miami where I traveled in and out of, and walking up to the kiosks were very intimidating. I think they were intimidating for two reasons. We felt like the process of getting a ticket and boarding a flight was so cumbersome, we couldn't deal with it ourselves. There was too many questions. Where, how do I select the seat? Where am I gonna get my ticket? How do I check my bag? And then there was the trust issue. Can I walk up to this machine and trust that I'll accomplish what I want, especially if I have to put a credit card in or if I have to pay? Do I trust that I can share my information with that machine? So they had, if you remember, red coats, and they had Delta employees that were called red coats, and they were standing out there in red coats. And if you had a question, they'd walk up. But they were that self-service point of, if you will, artificial intelligence, where they were looking for body language. They were saying, when is somebody confused? When is somebody looking at a machine with concern? When did it take them longer to touch the screen than um, we wanted them to. And so they would walk up and they would make sure that that guest experience was what it should be. Um, the other piece that I think technology gives us is, is the data and the analytics that, that let us look at what we're selling, when we're selling it, what's that work through, um, and all of those different pieces that come with how do we make better decisions for a better guest experience, which again, if you leave the breadcrumbs, they'll leave their money because the experience was more compelling. Uh, the innovation and the technology advancements uh, are interesting in how and what we see coming. I think that uh, if you look at this conference or you look most anywhere, there's a, a real belief that hardware is still a big component of self-service. And I think it is today and it will be for the short-term foreseeable future, but I think long-term, let's call it seven to ten years, if not sooner, um, Self-service is really going to be your own device. I just think that if people are going to read a menu, they're going to read a menu on their own device. I think if they're going to buy something, they're going to scan a QR code or an RFID tag, and they're going to buy right from their phone, and the card's going to spit out in my case, or they're going to walk up to a vending machine, and they're going to have pre-ordered it from their desk. As they're walking, they're going to be picking their snack, and they're going to get their snack from the machine. So I think the self-service piece of it really just says that as technology gives us that bandwidth to do what we want to accomplish, it continues to change from a hardware component to a much more software interface, and I think that's going to be broadly seen. I think that um, you know the, the airlines today, when you get on a newer aircraft, if you get on a 737 MAX, I haven't been on one yet that has a TV screen. So they've removed all of those screens and they've made it where your own device connects to their Wi-Fi and you're on their Wi-Fi. If you pay for internet access, you get out of that off the aircraft. And if you stay within the aircraft, you can watch the same movies and whatever else they're broadcasting internally, but they've taken off thousands of pounds of weight from the aircrafts and devices and repairs and all of those things. So that hardware, as it starts to go away, makes self-service more and more reliable because it makes the, the onus of the hardware on the user. The other piece there is that that software, if you will, that underground tunnel of Disneyland has to be much more robust because we don't know the device they're going to be on. We don't know the size of their screen. We don't know if they're going to want to hold their screen vertical or horizontal. We don't know if their screen, if their device is encrypted or not, and does it does it have what it takes to handle a payment, or is their device not able to handle a payment? So as that technology applies, I think as the owner shifts, we'll see a continued push to what that looks like. Um, the reduction of human error is interesting. I think. Um, from our perspective, and I certainly would love to take the approach that the customer is always right. I don't know that that's the reality of it, but a guest that walks up to a manager after having interacted with a card host in our venue and comes up and says, I want to exchange my product, and we say, we well, can't, you've already used it, you've, you've, you've taken credits off it, we have no way to reverse it. And they say, oh, but they, they sold me the wrong product. And so they want to blame it on human error. They want to say that the guest didn't, that the, the team member didn't explain to them the product. And if you were to go back in time, I think if you step back and relook at it, you'd look up and that's the guest that walked up and said, I just want a $50 card. They're already in a rush to um, get through the, the buying process and get out onto the game floor. But the reduction in human error is real in that the, if there's human error, now the onus is on the end user, um, but also giving them the ability to modify that and make those changes is that workflow that makes it 
um, very interesting. You know, just recently, I'm not much of a fast food eater, but my my youngest, I'm not young anymore, my, my oldest turned 20 two days ago. I'm not really sure how that happened. And my youngest is 17, but um, wanted to stop at McDonald's on our way up to Orlando for my daughter's birthday. And so we stopped at McDonald's and the drive through was too full and we went on the inside and we walked up to their kiosks. And if anybody's here has interacted with the McDonald's kiosk, um, I think it's fair to say it's one of the worst interfaces I've worked with, which blows me away from the perspective that they've now shut down the registers at the front. I wanted to pay cash and you have to buy it on the kiosk and then select cash and you have to stand there and wait and beg and plead for somebody to come over so your order could get pushed through because you've now finally paid for it. But their kiosk made no sense. Um, but I saw customers walk in and blast through their orders and we were still trying to figure out our order. So because it's not intuitive to me, it felt like a bad interface, but the end users that have gotten used to it are able to use that kiosk and be very comfortable with it. Uh, Taking that to the polar opposite, there's a Wawa that recently opened up near my office and I can go by and grab a quick, simple lunch and I could be back in my car in three minutes and, and go. They've added self-service checkout kiosks, if anybody's seen them. They've got small barcode scanners. They only take credit cards. It's a touch screen. Well, recently I was standing there a little frustrated because I had two hard boiled eggs and a pack of cheese and I was scanning it. And I looked at it and I said, oh, I rang up the eggs twice. And so I actually thought to myself, well, I'm just going to pay and I'm going to go get a second set of eggs and I'll eat them tomorrow, throw them in my fridge and that's what I'm going to get. And I stopped for a second and said, well, that doesn't make any sense because I realized that it's already the honor system. They already believe you're going to ring in what you're getting and they go there. I'm sure there's a calculation for what that breakage looks like. And I looked at the screen and you could remove an item. You can edit your order right on the screen. And it was intuitive enough that I just, I was like, oh, edit order, delete this line, and wanted to confirm that this is what I wanted, and I paid with a credit card, and still in three minutes I was back in my car. So that interface makes that experience different. I don't necessarily need McDonald's kiosks to get more comfortable for me or a better interface. I don't plan on going there very often, but that's the Hilton, and the Marriott is the um, Wawa to me and that those interfaces are so comfortable that I'm happy to never wait in the line to pay because I'm paying with a credit card. In fact, I'm paying with my phone. So back to my own device, I walk in with my phone, which is also my car key. I get in there, I get what I want. I walk up to a self-service kiosk, I tap my phone and I'm back in my car. Um, pretty big vending machine, right? That's a self-service experience and yet it's a convenience store. So pretty remarkable and that human error piece that I made human error, I was able to remedy for myself. I didn't need a manager to come over and enter a secret code and do any of those things. It worked out really nice. Scalability is another piece that's very interesting, which was early on for me in the vending business. As I said, I went to sleep so comfortable that I felt that I was gonna wake up and whether it was 35 cents more in my machine because another Frito-Lays had sold or a soda had dispensed, uh, the, the ability to look at it and say, I can scale and put out more vending machines and really grow that end result was so comforting to me and was so interesting that I felt that that was gonna have a big impact. And whether it's that you can look at Amazon and say it's now scaled globally and they can deliver something almost anywhere and they can deliver to areas that don't have stores or don't have products or any of those things, it's pretty remarkable. Market expansion, I've talked about briefly, but your ability to expand your market because you're in a self-service environment, whether it's at a location or at a service point that wouldn't have existed if you had to man it or had to do something. Um, even if you had to put the product on a sim similar um, self-service experience, but not have the data and the technology available to you, you wouldn't necessarily be able to expand into a small market because you wouldn't have to know what you need to get back for and when you need to service it. So that ability for data delivery changes the market expansion drastically. Um, Built-in trust, I think we talked about, but early on, I think if anybody was shopping online in the mid 90s, probably I, I may, may have had my first interaction online where I tried to buy something. And I could tell you it wasn't comfortable typing in my credit card number. I didn't feel like I should do it, right? Back then the card numbers were still impacted on our cards and when you went somewhere they had a knuckle buster and they slid it across and there was a carbon copy and you signed it. And it felt that that integrity of putting it into a screen and hitting submit, you had no idea where it was going, right? I mean, if you'd have asked me, it was definitely the Russians taking my credit card. I mean, it was no doubt. They were taking my credit card, they were gonna buy weapons with it, right? So it just felt not secure. Well, today we've built in 
the comfort and the trust in our platforms and that makes a big difference. Uh, the speed and what someone's looking for when they want something that result that I use as an example of, of Amazon um, or anything else. So you can take Amazon and that's a physical delivery, but the speed of you're laying in bed and you got a call and you realize you've got to be on a flight in the morning and without getting out of bed, you pull up your phone, you go to your preferred airline, you find the flight the next morning, you set your alarm and you go back to sleep. That's pretty comforting, right? That's that, tr I now trust my app, I can, they have my credit card, they have my payment type, I've gotten what I wanted accomplished significantly better than calling Delta and waiting for a representative and explaining where I want to go and them walking through the options. Um, staffing challenges, uh, I don't really know that uh, everybody or anybody in this room for that matter has looked at it, but we're large format arcades, so going into COVID we were 350 team members coming out of COVID, I think we were 900 in four months, but still only had 180 people that would show up. So it was a pretty challenging time. So staffing challenges through COVID were probably highlighted. And as we had made impacts on our self-service experience, we found that positions were eliminated as we've seen everywhere. Um, reduction of friction is really just that ability for a guest to have and do what they want when they want without that need to interact with somebody or, um, you know, people really speak much more than they do um, physically than they do verbally. And when you're walking up to a team member that's not having a good day, I think you know it. And so that ability to remove the friction is um, very interesting. The, the last piece I'll touch on, which I think is almost my Walt Disney moment in my world um, of the experience I had was that we were at um, five stores at the time and I was spending some time in our Miami Center, which is right down the street. And I found that the redemption process, so we give out prizes for tickets in our centers, and if you had um, tickets on your card or if you had paper tickets, you would get those tickets counted. They would get added to your account. Once they were added to the account, you could stand around a herd of people that were trying to get someone's attention to pick a prize and then get their prize and leave. And I remember being there, and at the time we were paper tickets, and you would feed them into a ticket shredder that would accrue the tickets on a screen, and then you would swipe your card and it would go on it. Well, in theory, <laughs> it didn't really do that all the time. So on a regular basis, that API, that, that speaking of two different platforms, in fact, a third platform in there from a ticket counter and a barcode scanner that was identifying if it was the right tickets, and then our card system, um, that communication would break down on a regular basis. And if somebody said, I had 1,980 tickets, they got 1,980 tickets. We had nothing else that we could do. We could reset it and tell the next guest and hope that it worked for that guest. And it probably worked 85 out of 100 times, but 15% of the time it didn't work, or maybe it probably got better towards the end, but it was really a high point of friction. Well, once you did that, now you went and stood there, as I said, with that herd of people and if you were with young kids, so our centers are really more developed towards adults, um, but, you know, adults call them um, teenagers up to 24, 35 year old kind of experience. And then we serve the um, family market very well. So parents with kids, if you were with kids, now the end of your experience was the single worst part of your experience. And so we, I came to realize as I was working there on a Saturday night was that they had a great experience they came in, they bought what they want. If we're lucky, they dined with us. Unequivocally, the food was better than they were expecting. We're a full scratch kitchen and we serve great food. We're very proud of it. Don't serve nearly as much as we'd like, but I don't think people sit at home and say, we're gonna go to a arcade for dinner. When they come in and they have dinner, I'm happy with it and they're happy with it. Um, but on their way out the door, when they finally ran out of credits or convinced their kid that the credits will still be on the card, will come back another time, then they went to redemption and it took what should have taken three minutes, 20 or 25 minutes. And it was just a bad experience. Uh, more recently, I'm gonna call it a year and a half, we've rolled out a redemption kiosk that really feels like an online platform. And so you walk up and tap your card and a shopping cart pulls up or a, a, what looks like an Amazon web store, if you will, select your products that are all available based on your tickets. When you've completed it, you hit complete and it prints at the redemption counter and they pick up the merchandise and go. And while that seems revolutionary for what we're doing, that was service merchandise in the 1980s, right? <laughs> you went up, selected your product, and they brought it out because you couldn't touch any of the product. So I think a lot of what we learn is based on the history and the experiences we've had, as I've talked about, and that's impacted a lot of how and what we can do um, on our self-service side. So um, there's some time for questions. If anybody wants to jump in, I'm certainly happy to answer questions and happy to share.
can't really see because the lights are so bright. Um, if not, I've gotten a good tan while I'm up here. Where are we at? Uh, oh. Can you hear me? It's not on, no. Try it now. Okay, can you hear me now? Now we okay. can. Mike, thank you. Um, you you happen to be working in a, a, a space now in the amusement industry where there is a huge amount of innovation taking place in immersive experiences such as virtual reality and augmented reality and mixed reality, whatever kinds of reality. And, and I know that you are someone who pays very careful attention to all the innovation going on. Uh, what, what is your view about all that incredible extended reality out in, in your space? Sure. Um, so it's an interesting question in that of all the people, and, and I'm really a data-driven person, I think if I haven't if I haven't conveyed that, I, I tend to not feel like my opinion matters much. I tend to really feel that our guests will determine what the outcome is, right? That that cost of perfection is, is uh, progress, so we'd rather get the progress. In the VR world, it's almost stepped way backwards uh, because the technology and how they're delivering it takes a human interaction, takes a team member to put them on. And so when people think of VR today, I think you're probably envisioning a dark room and you've got a backpack on and a headset and a gun in your hand and you're walking around and that's called free roam virtual reality. And so in that environment, I don't think free roam has a real uh, leg to stand on in our business because it steps so far back in what self-service is. So now uh, the hard part about selling VR in that particular example is that the end user has no idea what they're getting. It's usually behind a closed door. They don't know what they're doing. And if they're watching someone in VR, it really looks pretty boring because you're so immersed in the experience that you're not, you're not expressing any emotion. You're not doing a lot of physical motion. So motion causes emotion. And if you're not moving much, there's not a lot of emotional expression. So as we've seen VR try to roll more into our space, they've gotten significantly better at self-service VR where now there's a sit-down seat and a tethered headset that you pull down over your head and start to interact with it. So I think there's an interesting play on VR. I think VR will become more impactful as again the devices become the onus is on the end user. So um, when Google Glasses become augmented reality that are significantly better but when you're in my arena you can play a branded game you'll show up with your own headset in this case your glasses and you'll experience our VR arena. I think that's where that kind of plays off but I think that the hardware today is where the failure points are because the software is typically the race and they're not keeping up the hardware is not keeping up with the software and the experiences. So I think VR has an interesting place, but I think it has a long way to go. So. Um, I'll ask a question out for the audience if anybody wants to volunteer. Um, does anybody out here have an experience that's particular to self-service that they feel they've made an impact on that you think might be compelling to, to tell the story and how or what they've done? Anybody want to share? Not everybody at once. You can only have one microphone. Um, I'll, touch, I'll, I'll touch on one more quick subject that I think is interesting in that framed question. Um, so we have a software provider that runs our platform, and we run a full venue management system that does everything for us. It's our POS. It's our kiosk. It's our HR. It's our redemption system. It's our redemption inventory. It's our food and beverage. Truly one system that does everything. Um, that comes with the challenge is that a system that does everything doesn't do anything great, right? So there's, if you go to a Micros Fidelio POS, then it's gonna be a really good POS. You may not be able to get it to do what you want it to do like you see Starbucks doing because they've got the engineers and the software behind it, but you have a significantly better POS. Or if you go purely to a kiosk manufacturer and say, I wanna be able to sell these three items, I wanna take a payment, then it spits out, you're gonna get a better end product there. Well, when we looked at our kiosks before we took on redemption kiosks and started working on that interface, I had really gotten to where we had launched our kiosks and I think the goal was to get rid of card hosts. And I say I think because I don't know that we ever thought it through. We now had kiosks that were working and could accomplish it, so we started removing card hosts and putting more kiosks. 
And so as I started to think through, well, what's that end goal, right? And if I'm the undertaker and I just want my phone to ring, that end goal was just getting control of that process, that guest experience allowed to flow. So as we realized that we had probably missed that step, or I should say probably, we, we absolutely missed that step, we just said these kiosks could replace people. And it wasn't so much a, a labor calculation, it was, it was just that we could move the line faster, it was that we thought if we needed more, we could put more, we could spread them out through the building so they weren't coming back to the front to get something if they wanted, all of those things that were very basic. We started to say, well, what if the experience was better? And what if what we had worked so hard to get the the card host to do, which was upsell or sell the right product, we could build into that interface. So while our software provider had put together a kiosk that was very mechanical and you walked up and you could buy a product and it spit out, we had taken on and built one in, the, in our office and said that our goal was to modify it to the ability of what we could within settings and different things that we could change to the point we broke it. Every time the goal was what could we break that taught us something about what we could accomplish. And so the joke became with our provider, Geo, who was our point of contact at the time, um, would know that when his phone rang, we had finally broke it again. And it was very funny, but it had become that piece. And we said to them, well, we want the buttons to be able to modify in size on these screens. And on these screens, we don't need them to. And he said, you can't do that. And I took that as a challenge. And we can modify the size of buttons, and he didn't know we could. And so we went in and modified the size of buttons, but put some outside what it could take, so we broke it, and then we had put an item in place, and we had broke the coding so bad that we could no longer launch the software and needed him to go undo what we did to the point where we got it back. So the joke was, um, you know, how quick could we make the phone ring? Because we went and found something that he said we couldn't do, that we got it to do, but then we broke it. And so that willingness to push the limits with your provider, with your software, with whatever piece you're doing, I'd encourage you to do, and I'd encourage you to do it in a controlled environment, but you'll be surprised on how much you can impact that end user, that guest experience, and that workflow through your product or your sales point that you'll have um, significantly better results. So that's my story. Thank you so much for having me.